behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from playing sports to exotic whips. Ain't gotta tell me, dog. I know I'm the shit behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from music exec to this podcast. Now I finally feel at home and left behind the bar. Yo, yo, what up, y'all? Happy President's Day. Um, whatever the fuck that means, because it means nothing to me. But you are tuned in to the world famous Behind the Baller podcast, live and direct from Los Angeles, California. This is a Dust Brothers production, museum quality podcast. And it's all we do here, y'all. I am your host, Ben Baller, not Ben Humble, a.k.a. the Korean Bill Murray. Yeah, that's my guy. All right, the K Town Hooligan, the Korean Harvey Keitel. There ain't nobody a bigger scumbag than that motherfucker. Okay, and still and always the original Odessu. Right, speaking of Odessu, aka Old Boy, if you haven't added any Korean flicks into your, into your shit, like from 2001 to 2013 Korean movies, to your film database, then you're lost and whatever. Some people don't care about movies here and there, whatever. I'm Look, I'm a film buff. And not because I got my degree in cinematography, but I've always been a fan since back in the day here and there, right? There's some classic films I didn't get to see till I was later because I just was like, eh. And then when I saw it, I was like, yo, that shit is mid, right? But if Parasite was the first cram movie that you ever saw, then... Look, man, you wouldn't understand why. I, I was hyped for Koreans on that win, on that Oscar win, but that movie doesn't even make my top 10 Korean flicks, okay? Like, not even. And Old Boy is not even number one. It's, you know what, it's number two. It's got to be. Maybe number, nah, it's number, number two or number three. As far as overall film quality and and, like, from direction to acting to story, if you thought Parasite fucked you up, and P- Parasite was, listen, that's very Korean typical, like, they will pull you left, right, north, south, motherfucking northwest, southwest. If you thought Parasite story was good, it's just, Korean shit is always so well thought out. You watch Old Boy, and it'll fuck you up. And Odesu is a fucking G. Definitely the, the top ajushi in film history, okay? Uh, Wan Bin gets, you know what I'm saying? He, he gets maybe second or third villain because ajushi, the movie, was incredible. I know I'm confusing so many motherfuckers, but the number one Korean movie in my book, in my life, my personal favorite is Chingu. Nothing will ever, ever top that movie to me. That movie, just everything, what it means to me, like on a fucking personal level. I've watched the movie over a hundred times. Anytime some of my dogs would get out of jail, we'll watch Chingu. Even when the ones who aren't even Korean, okay? In fact, you know what? I'm going to do a greatest movie list again. I forgot if I did top 50 or what I did last, last time on my, um, this was the first year when, when the pod first went up. But Chingu might have made it to top three now. It's gotten that good with time. But yeah, as I said, guys, this is a Dust Brothers production. Shout out to Miles Davis and Jordan Winter. This is the Behind the Baller podcast. Anybody who's questioning the ranking, the popularity, show me your podcast. Fully independent. All right. No studio backing, nothing. I don't even fucking post it on my Instagram page that much. I want it to grow gradually on its own. I don't force feed it through my Instagram feed. I don't force feed it anywhere else. I post a new episode when it pulls up on Twitter because it has a hyperlink and it's easier to post on my stories, but I push the page because I'm trying to grow these things evenly, right? But yes, we are a top ranked podcast. That is not a motherfucking lie. That is a fact. And that is globally. Now, when it comes to the entrepreneurship category, We are a top 10 podcast. Facts. We came out the gate number one in the entire business category. We have broken the top 10 many times. Not once, not two times, not seven times, not 10 times, many times. All right. I'm proud of it. 
just letting you guys know, there is a lot of podcasts out there. I told you there's near 2.4 million podcasts in the cloud, in any streaming shit, whatever, but that's where it is. Guys, it is Fan Appreciation Day. Listen, um, we do the fan questions once a month. For a little while, I was I was slacking. I was like, yo, it was like six weeks, and it was like, you know, every two months, and it was like, boom. Nah, we're going to make sure the motherfucker pops up every four to five weeks, once a month. We're still going to try to, you know, I don't have a schedule and write it down. I will start getting shit more tight. We're actually thinking about, like I said, thinking about shopping the show to some studios. And it's not necessarily for the money because I make money on here now. But at that point, I can delegate, you know, someone to actually do the filming part, the editing stuff and everything. Miles is always going to make sure this shit sounds high definition stereo. You know what I mean? Like there's never going to be a podcast that sounds this good as far as the sound goes. That will never, ever fall off. But once we get some of that, and you would think, shit, almost three years and, you know, two and a half years in the game now. Well, we're two and a half years in the game, almost at three. And there'd be more structure. But that's not what I want. You know? And, you know, at the same time, you know, I'm just letting you guys know that this is a very unorthodox podcast. Why Jordan uh, chose to make this a business entrepreneur podcast, I don't know. But at the same time, as much as it's lifestyle and, you know, there's a little bit of sports, music, it's just pretty much everything across the board. But I have been giving y'all free game for a long time. One of my homies, Trivin McCoy, is in a band called Gym Class Heroes. About 10 years ago, a little longer than that, maybe 12 years ago, he had the number one song in the world called Billionaire with Bruno Mars. And uh, he said some shit out today, man. He was, he was, you know, and he's just not the type of dude to flex on anybody, get mad, this and that. This dude is actually a very incredible person. And he hit me up and he said, Ben, you older than me and you've been dropping free game for so long. And um, I have never even thought in the last five years that Travi was paying attention. And I don't think he cares about social media like that. He used to have dumb followers. This motherfucker had like, you know, when it was impossible to get a million on MySpace and he had that when he had, uh, when he started Twitter, he had dumb followers. Then he got on Instagram. We got on Instagram and things kind of changed. You know, the platforms change a lot. So when the next shit comes out on TikTok, some people might have 4.5, 10 million followers on TikTok. It really depends on what's important and where things drive. But I try to keep that shit even. The TikTok shit, I just can't. I just, sometimes I fuck with it, but I just, I got three kids. All right. <laughs> I got, you know, five jobs. But yeah, back to fan questions. We'll structure this. I will start doing different segments of the show. But again, this is an unorthodox show. I just try to help people out with their drive. With uh, And I, I mean that in two ways. I mean that like people who are driving to work, people who are driving as truck drivers, people are doing all that shit. And then as well as their motivational drive. All right. So we got fan questions coming up in a little bit. But yay still on that shit. Right. Did I even say this on the last episode? I, look, I don't know if I said this on the last episode and I apologize because, you know, I'm getting old. But I, I did tell you, right, he, he texted me from a random ass number. was talking about, yo, you didn't have that energy last time I seen you, right? So I was going to troll him because Soldier Boy went off on him. And I don't really, you know, Soldier Boy, look, man, it's like he's there for entertainment. I understand what, you know, what purpose he serves and stuff. But at the same time, it's like. I don't know, man. It's a weird thing. But it's also typical of Soldier Boy. But Soldier Boy said some shit and it was fucking hilarious. Yo, Miles, you got that clip real quick, man? Kanye, wake up. Skeet got your bitch, nigga. What you gonna do? Is you gonna peep, keep posting memes of Marvel versus Capcom? <laughs> <laughs> or you gonna lay the smack down? Lame man, nigga. Fuck you talking about. <laughs> Yo, I ain't gonna lie, man, you know, on some cheap entertainment, it, it's fucking funny. But Ye, on Saturday, went at Corey Gamble. For those of you who are decent people and don't give a fuck about pop culture, you probably don't know who the fuck Corey Gamble is, and I love everyone who doesn't know who he is. But if you know who he is, then you know he's Chris Jenner's boyfriend, 
side toy, whatever. The fu- whatever no, I'm sorry, not even a side. That's her man, right? After um, Bruce Jenner and it's Caitlyn Jenner. Now. Look, I'm not really 100%, um, you know, I'm not even fucking explain myself for that. Fuck that. Forget it. Anyways, Corey Gamble was Chris Jenner's boyfriend. I don't know if they're still together or not, whatever. I've never fucked with dude. Like, never, ever have I rocked with dude. And I met Corey like around 2011 or 2012. I, I've known Corey for like 2000, like no, for 10 years. And he's the master, master ladder climber, fucking um, manipulator, cap, bullshit, everything. And, I, you know, he's gotten fucking crazy gifts from her. You know, he's he's got all the paddocks. He's got all the AP watches, you know, chills in Calabasas. And when Kanye, Kanye been going at him for a while, right? Kanye called him Kanye and all kinds of stuff. I don't even know where Corey's backstory's from. And I don't give a fuck, right? I just know I don't, I don't fuck with dude. I remember one time I see him at a birthday party and I was like, hey, what's good, homie? I was like, okay. He had like a Ferrari polo on, was like, Rocky. He's like, yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, oh, you got a Rari now? Oh, shit, okay, Corey, you got a Rari? He's like, yeah, I got, I got every, you know what I'm saying? I got a few Raris, man. I was like, oh, what'd you just pick up, dog? He's like, yeah, I got a 599 Marinello. Excuse me? You got a 599 Marinello? Or, or you mean you got a 575 Marinello? What the fuck are you even talking about, homie? Do you even know what the fuck you're talking about? And it's just funny because he's just all cap, you know? And a lot of people I know that live in Calabasas, that kind of, it's like the little, you know, that little gated community. It's like that fucking um, Desperate Housewives shit, except on an upper echelon level. Seen him at the Laker games, you know, he's cool with like fucking um, Ruigi, which is fucking super typical. But Ye went in his ass. Like, <laughs> look, man, if it's one thing, he got in his ass. And it was just fucking hilarious. He broke it down. He had his personal reasons. So, you know what? That's cool. Look, fuck it. Call him out, right? Even a fucking, you know, a broken clock is wrong twice a day, they say, right? But um, Rodney Jerkins, super producer, this is, you know, I don't think he's had, look, I'm not a Wikipedia and I'm not a fact checker. Off the top of my head, Rodney Jerkins was big in the mid 90s, okay? Maybe even a little bit in the late 90s. After that, I never heard his fucking name. Now, I'm sure he was around doing stuff and he has publishing and everything else. He's worked with some big people like Michael Jackson and shit. But he messaged Ye and Ye screenshot his message saying, yo, man, he stole music from me, stole this. I don't put shit past Corey Campbell. I don't fuck with dude, cannot stand that motherfucker. So allegedly, Corey Gamble got caught cheating on Chris Jenner, which, well, look, I don't know about you motherfuckers out here. One... I could never be with a woman who made more money than me. It's not about an ego thing or anything else. I just, I would have to strive and, and try to do my own thing. I shouldn't say it like that because my wife comes from a very prominent family, right? But I mean, like, I'm going to hold it down, you know? And like, Corey ain't doing shit. I remember when I pulled up with, because he was, he was Bieber's, like, road manager. Like, this dude was literally like one of Bieber's, like, executive assistants. This dude wasn't even, and then he started working for Scooter Braun. And I ain't going to get into fucking even getting even a scooter. There's like, there's tea all over the place with Bieber and all that. And I appreciate now that Justin has gotten older and understands what's going on. He's just like, fuck it. It's not that it's, it, you know, it's, it is broken, but like it's working and I'm going to manage the way the fucking, I'm too rich. I'm too famous still. Boom. So, you know, but there's all kinds of shit. So like, I remember I had Bieber a deal for $2 million for like, an hour show, not even an hour show, fuck, like 20 minute performance and to kick it for an hour with a prince. And this is the story I've told before. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but Corey got involved. I don't even know why. I don't know how or why, but Scooter and all them were on some other shit. I don't know how to fuck, you know, there's all these deals that happen in Hollywood. And then there's the middleman, right? Some of these middlemen are very important because they are the person that actually connects the person to the person that needs to get connected. Now, some people may not like that middleman, but at the end of the day, there is a middleman who really serves a purpose. This motherfucker strictly serves as a leech to get money off certain things, whatever, and uses his networks for that. I don't ever use that. If I ever connect somebody, I don't need shit from it. That is no fucking cap. 
Okay. If me and LaMelo Ball were boys, right, we barely know each other. And I, before the fucking Charlotte Hornets situation, obviously he plays for the fucking team that MJ owns. But if I connected with MJ, I wouldn't want to fucking that one. But, oh, dog, you owe me tickets to the game. You owe me this. No, I don't need shit. I've connected a lot of people with big people. All right. Even recently, Pharrell reached out because he needed a phone number. And I was like, dog, I got that shit. Don't even trip. I don't need shit from Pharrell. I need no motherfucking shoes from, from anybody. From any, I don't need none of that shit. Anyways, Corey's about that bitch life, period. Let me get that fuck out the way. God damn, I spent way too much time on that. Uh, speaking of Justin Bieber, he got COVID-19. I uh, spoke to him. He's all right. He's going to be fine. I think he had to cancel his Vegas show uh, two nights ago or last night. And I know he got some shows coming up. He's got San Jose a week from today. I don't know. I know he's pissed off because... He had his entire tour pushed back a year, and that's a long time when you're already planning. He was ready to go. He didn't give a fuck. But the COVID protocols, you know, wasn't having it. So um, what else happened this weekend? Because it is the weekend wrap up. And I'm going to get into fan questions in a second. Oh, yeah. Our RV trip got canceled. Why? Well, we were thinking, let's get an RV. Let's go up to Santa Barbara. Let's go to this little campground. You know, uh, we checked out a spot in San Diego, but it was a little too, like, it was low-key sus. I just didn't feel like it, it was going to be right. And then we were going to party with some people who has RV as well, who have an RV as well. And then we realized, you know what? I'd rather be outdoors, even though RV is outdoors, but not, like, interacting with families we don't know, other people. Why does it matter? Because this week is me and my wife's 10-year wedding anniversary, right? We've been together for 12 years already. And this Thursday, or I'm sorry, was it Friday? This Friday will be our 10-year anniversary married, right? So we're leaving the country in three days. We did not want to have any kind of COVID protocol shit happen or nothing. I'm good. I ain't tripping. I got the antibodies and I've been vaccinated, whatever, Nicolette's vaccinated. She's uh, boosted up. But we just didn't want to have that shit, right? So we said, fuck it. Let's do a happy meeting. We could be outdoors and not have to be around whatever. So we went to Six Flags. Six Flags was lit. It was good. You know, um, we bought a season pass last year. And we didn't buy the season pass until late. And it shit ended up being beautiful. Like, ended up being worth it. Because if you go there for the day and you do everything you need to do, whatever, it's like $105, right? Not, I mean, which is not bad considering it's probably cheaper than everything except fucking Knott's Berry Farm. But like Legoland is more, Disneyland is more. And you're thinking about activities for the kids to have fun, right? We could be outside, have fun. At, and the thing is, London ain't even got to every single ride yet. He's gotten pretty close. You know, he hasn't hit Superman yet. He hasn't hit Viper. He hasn't hit X2 or Tattoo, but everything else he's hit. Even full throttle, like blew his mind. But Ryder's just barely getting there with Ninja and a couple other things. He hasn't hit Goliath yet. Kaya is barely going on Ninja. And so they're just, we're all just starting to get into it. And I remember I didn't start going ham at Six Flags till I was 12. And then shit changed for me forever. So by the time London is 12, he's going to understand what he needs to do. He could drop the kids off, they could play, and boom. And they're going to have their fucking good time. Maybe I could have a chaperone go with them, whatever. Maybe I'll go. I don't know. But it's, it's fucking me up going there because we go on these fucking rides. And some of them are fast and it fucks me up. But it's my equilibrium. You know? It's my endorphins <laughs> that, that can't take the fucking, just the, the shaking around and all that shit. But the funny part is you get five passes, right? And some people are like, oh, why don't you do VIP? Why don't you, why don't you shut the fuck up? We doing this a lot more than you think. And then you get the flash pass, they call it, right? And the flash pass is, the fuck, how much is it per person? I think it's like $250 a person, which lets you bypass all the lines. So if you do the season pass for that, it's $360 a person. Now, that right there is a huge savings if you go five times. So, you know, fuck it. The family pass was a fucking steal. 
I mean, the season pass for the whole family. We did that. We didn't do all the little shit with the meals and all that other bullshit, whatever, boom. And I just, I don't want to have any restrictions. I just want to be able to like pull up and go where the fuck I want to go and not have to worry about the bullshit. Bottom line is, what I'm getting at is spend fucking 3000 something dollars one fucking time so we can have the rest of the year lit and not worry about it. And it's just, the app is pretty good. I don't know if, if for those of you who are parents out there, I'm sure you know now with Magic Mountain, well, with, with Six Flags, with Disneyland, whatever, everything's to an app. Now, you can walk up to a window and order food, but you want to use the app. It's actually faster, which is fucked up, right? Pretty soon, there really is going to be robots running these fucking places. And I didn't think about it until I saw McDonald's was robots and that but bitch or was a Burger King. I forgot. And I remember even at my mall, Beverly Center, where my store is, you know, or any mall, any fucking mall, or any place there was always an attendant there to take your ticket at the parking lot and when you're leaving, all that shit. Now, there's no attendant nowhere. There's a credit card machine, there's that, there's boom. There's one person just managing everything on the phone and it's just what it is. Soon that's gonna be happening anywhere you fucking go to. We get served like fast food, semi-fast food, whatever the fuck it may be at a park, whatever. What's my point? Just breaking everything down to y'all. Six Flags was fun. We had a good time. We got there right when it opened at 10.30, left at like five something. And, uh, you know, the Disneyland, it's like, it's too cutesy. Like, Kaya fuck with it, but, every, you know, the boys, they're cool with it. I mean, we probably got another two years we could fuck with Disneyland. But, you know, Legoland right now, that's their shit. Universal Studios is cool, um, but Six Flags is now they're really getting into it. And it's not that bad. It's like a 30-minute drive, and it's just a fucking bargain right now. Especially if you don't give a fuck about, you know, Paying the extra, like, the look, if you get a pass, season pass, now parking is free. I don't know if it, it I, I need to double check on that, but last year, parking was free with the season pass, general parking. Now, I'm a certified handicap, right? I'm registered as a disabled person with the state of California. So I park right in fucking front and we're Gucci. So for a hundred bucks to have that shit for the rest of the year and just basically, I'm the one paying for food which it is what it is. But think about, you know, the purpose that you have there now as far as like entertainment, fun for the kids. I don't know if they still do concerts, but back in the day, they used to have a dope-ass concerts. It's usually kitty bop shit, like New Edition and stuff. New Edition would be obviously fucking amazing, but I don't know if like Selena Gomez, these people, like these YouTube, I don't know, but I do know that they're building a new ride called Wonder Woman there. It's going to be the craziest ride. It's going to be like the top three fastest. It's like the top one or two tallest, some motherfuckers big. But the only thing that sucks is they remove like three or four rides just in a short time that they're building it. It's coming out this summer. Why am I talking about washed up dad shit? Because I'm a dad of three kids, all right? So anyways, um, let's get into this motherfucking, um, these fan questions. Oh, you know what? I, was, I had to say this real quick, man. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to say this. One of my agents, who I've known for a very long time, Suppose some really weird shit. I know there's legal shit and there's certain things, but like, look, dog, at a certain time, man, I understand business is business, but sometimes shit is deeper than an NDA or like just weird shit. And, you know, it's sad that some people have to be robots when it comes to protecting their family or living, you know, you follow protocol. I understand that. But there are emotions that are still involved. And just random as fuck. Like, dog, what's up, bro? Like, you went to Clutch? Like, bro, I respect Rich Paul and what they're doing over there, but bro, you think this, man, there's an underdog story and then there's a different story. Tesla is not an underdog, no matter what the fuck anyone says now. They are the overdog. You know, I ain't talking about something like that. I'm talking about imagine like you being like, not even fucking Koenigsegg, something small. And then going up against Mercedes Benz. It's like, come on, man. Like, just random. And I, I look, don't know, but I just thought I'd let you guys know. Weirdo shit, man. If you are in a contract with something and you can't legally speak to somebody and you do certain shit, but you guys really rock with each other and you guys have some shit, there's a way to not, but you know what? You never know because we live in a weird ass era where people are bitches. Tell somebody a secret. That shit ain't no secret no more. And I get that part, you know? That's why there's so much shit that's stuck in my head. And what stays the mental Rolodex is important. What doesn't 
and what needs I don't sit there to click be like oh shit I wasn't supposed to tell Rachel that fucking Bobby was fucking Lassie I don't fucking know I'm just making up shit all right let's get into fan questions real quick let's get into commercial yo Miles throw on some Lakey we'll be right back with the fan questions How did you choose which internet service provider to use? The sad thing is most of us have very little choice because ISPs operate like monopolies in the regions they serve for people like us. They use this power to take advantage of customers. But worst of all, many ISPs log your internet activity and then sell that data to other big tech companies and advertisers. To prevent ISPs from seeing my internet activity, I protect all my devices with ExpressVPN. So what is ExpressVPN? It's a simple app for your computer or your smartphone that encrypts all your network data and tunnels it through a secure VPN server so that your ISP cannot be seen at all or any of your activity. Just think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, the list of people you've messaged, sites you've visited, and videos you've watched get tracked by tech giants who can sell your information for profit. That's the reason I recommend ExpressVPN as the best way to hide your online activity from your ISP. You just download the app, tap one button on your device, boom, you're protected. You can imagine how much I do on my phone and who I am talking to, so I have to be protected. ExpressVPN does all of this without slowing your connection. That's why it's rated the number one VPN service by Business Insider and The Verge. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me private online. Visit expressvpn.com slash baller. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash baller to get three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash baller right now to learn more. Most probiotics don't work. If you've ever struggled to find a good brand, here's why. To be truly effective, a probiotic must survive the trip from your mouth to your gut. The majority of probiotics, even the special refrigerated ones, die in your harsh stomach acid well before they get to where they're needed. That's why I'm a fan of Just Thrive Probiotic. Their exclusive strains are designed by nature to put up an armor-like shell when conditions get rough. In fact, studies have proven that Just Thrive Probiotic arrives 100% alive in your gut and ready to go to work. That's what makes them so uniquely effective at controlling gas, constipation, and bloating, and providing much needed immune support. They're vegan, non-GMO, gluten, dairy, and soy-free formula can even support beautiful skin, better sleep, and easier weight management. For exceptional health, there's nothing like the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic. Thousands of customers can't be wrong. Make this your year. Support your immune health with Just Thrive. Get 15% off when you go to justthrivehealth.com and use code BALLER at checkout. It's www.justthrivehealth.com. Make sure you use code BALLER at checkout. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2022, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for wireless? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. With Mint Mobile, 
choose the amount of monthly data that's right for you and stop paying for data that you will never use. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash baller. That's mintmobile.com slash baller. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mint.com slash baller. I just set my kids up on this Mint Mobile plan. What up, y'all? So this is the um, part of the show where I answer questions. And you know what? Before uh, we were doing it, we were doing it to, um, you know, build up the show. We are doing it through a certain format, through the iOS system. But then, like, some people who listen to Spotify to do certain things, you know, it was, like, confusing people because we are on, available on every platform. Anywhere you listen to a podcast, we're available there. So I just said, fuck it. We're going to have an email address. Um, pretty soon, I'm not going to fucking say the email address anymore. Maybe it'll be somewhere um, on the Instagram page or something. But if you want to ask a question, you go to Ben Ball to the blockchain at gmail.com. And so here we are. All right. And uh, we are going to get into question number one johnny chen writes hey big bro long time listener from kansas yo a chinese guy from kansas but he got 310 in his username on his email so he might be from la movie kansas i don't know anyways appreciate all the free game and the motivation question how do you keep your management team or even your business partners to stay motivated and work as hard as you um, how fucking crazy, right? Because I just talked about one of my ex-agents uh, that just, you know, which I'm good. I'm straight. You know what? That's the thing. I think there's a lot of pressure at these management agency companies and at these big sports agencies and stuff. And if they don't come in and bring, you know, hold their weight, then they're out. And it's just business. And that's what it is. And I think my agent had, you know, pulled his weight. I think... um, Again, I can't speculate. Fuck that. I'm not, I'm not even going to speculate. But my agent right now is about that life. He's as personal to the minimum, uh, maximum of the minimal to, you know, know that we cool. But he's about that paper. And he keeps it straight with me. And then people who own, the, you know, the companies I'm on sponsors with, they keep it 100 with me. And these are billion dollar companies or at least, you know, several hundred million dollar companies and um, they know what time it is. They put the spark under my ass. So that's a good question though, Johnny. God damn. Next up, I am reading these straight up raw off the top, right? Like Miles edit some of them, like meaning deleted them because motherfuckers is asking for jobs and whatever. And some dude's like, yo man, can I suck your dick? You know, boom, all that. Yes, I'm being dead serious. So Kyle Timmons from I don't know where writes, what advice do you have for someone who's just starting out in the jewelry game? Well, um, I assume that you have inventory unless you're a jeweler by trade, um, you know, being a wax cutter, a diamond setter, things like that. If you are a full service jewelry, you know, jeweler and you are selling jewelry and you are making as well and everything, I mean, it's a tough game. Imagine if the NBA was having open tryouts and, you know, think about everyone who plays basketball. And they put a cutoff age, whatever. This is jewelry. There's no cutoff age. You could be the fucking shit at 65 years old, meaning you could still be an amazing polisher. You could still be an amazing wax cutter. You could still be an amazing goldsmith. You could still be an amazing master jeweler in your 60s. So what advice do I have? One, if you're on any social media platforms, don't use the word jeweler in your name. Okay? You could do jewelry by Kyle. Right? Just don't go be Kyle the jeweler. It, it, that's not it. Now, no matter what anyone says, even me, whether I, because I've done it, you know, here and there, don't give jewelry out for free. That's too big a gamble and it doesn't always work. Right? If there is an overly saturated market, I would say the amount of jewelers there are would probably be, I'm not joking you at all right now, up there with the number of rappers there are. It, it's wild. So my suggestion and my advice for you 
One, study the greats. Two, make sure your shit is on A1 level. Three, don't be afraid to go under somebody else as a low-key apprentice. I don't mean you be somebody's bitch. I'm saying you can be a jeweler and start somewhere big until you build your shit up and build your clientele up and all that, things like that. Look, Elliot did it with Avion. Eliante, whatever the fuck. I don't, even know, I don't even know if that's his real fucking name. All right. But there are jewelers who've asked to be under me or join forces and whatever. I'm just letting you know right now, it's a dirty game. It's tough. I suggest if you even think about doing CVDs, HPHD, or Clarity Enhanced Stones or anything like that, that you are very clear with it. And if it was up to me, and I, you know, you're asking me directly, which I'm, I'm, you are, I would tell you to avoid that bullshit. So good luck with you, Kyle, man. I hope everything goes good. Okay with you. Um, Tyler from Toronto writes, my fiance, Joe and I are both registered nurses. Listen to the pod on our way to work mornings and evenings. Appreciate your words on being safe out there to listeners. Respect your health care. Anyways, the question for me is from the years together with Nick through thick and thin, what's some advice in keeping it going strong? I know every relationship is different, but what worked for you guys? We're getting married next year, and our family better not be on Filipino time. Haha, <laughs> much respect. You know what, man? It, I don't know if you guys work at the same place, but me and my wife have totally different lives. She has a totally different set of friends. Now, I'm cool with their friends, but I had my own set of friends. Would they all get along? Eh, it's all right, but that's probably what makes it good. If everyone is too buddy buddy in my book, then you need time. You need separation from your wife. I know that sounds crazy. Some people are like, oh no, you spend. Some people could do that shit. They could be married. You know what I'm saying? Never ever fucking been with another girl. Never been with another dude. You know, been together since third grade. All that little other bullshit. Come on, man. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying your you know your girlfriend or wife needs to be a whore or whatever, but. It's healthy for other women to be with other people and, and know, you know, that they've dated or been whatever and been like, yo, this is the best thing for me, for me. Because there is someone for everyone. No matter if you're fat, short, whatever the fuck it is. I just think that one strong point is I travel a lot, busy. We're not in each other's hair all the time. I think COVID brought us together 10 times stronger. Um, we do have three kids. So there's, there's a very big importance thing with, with family there. She's taught me a lot about family. Her family has taught me a lot about family, but you got to go through some rough patches in a way because you need to figure out what you might need to fix. So I don't know what's going on with you guys. I do hope you guys are all right. I do think that it is good for people to be married, you know, and, and, and be together. Some people don't need to be married. Some people aren't meant to get married. I get that. But for the ones who are, look, it is nice to be stable. It's nice to get a tax break, you know. And um, some people don't have an issue with date nights. They have all that and there's still issues. I can't speak on that because we don't get to have that with three kids. And people say, oh, you keep saying that, boom. And things things are a lot different when you have three kids in the day and age, you got to worry about, okay, is this nanny going to fuck up our house? Is something gonna, is someone going to fuck up something here? It, you know, my oldest son, London, is he going to be all right around this lady? Is this girl going to be calling her boyfriend? You, there's a lot of things you got to think about security-wise. Can we relax and not worry about it? Anytime we go out of town, that's why our family's around so much because we trust them so much. That's a big thing too. doesn't look like you guys have kids yet, but once you guys get married, you know, just understand that, when you guys, when you say I do and she says I do, it's y'all against the world. Please overstand that. It's you guys against the world. Remember that. Your kids come before your parents, period. Your kids come before anybody. Your wife comes before your mom. If your mom comes before your wife, don't get married, bro. Just don't. I don't give a fuck because your mom ain't want, gonna want to hear that shit, but she knows it's the fucking truth. And that's why most likely if she or her parents are still alive and your parents are still alive, the way that it goes is it's just gonna be her mom is gonna be around when you guys have kids and that's what's gonna be, all right? So expect to see Tita 
around more often. And, you know, you just... Look, when you start fighting about who moved the cup 10 feet or who fucking put the towel on down, that little shit, man, even if it builds up, man, fuck all that. That's what breaks you guys up. Then you guys were done from the beginning. It's the big shit you should worry about. But God bless, man. Sue Goat writes, Hey, thanks for answering my motorcycle question last time. I'm curious how your R34 Skyline project is going. Did you already buy one? Uh, and once it's ready, do you think you'll bring it to Osaka Outlaw event? You know what, man? I kind of taken a back seat on the R34. I'm not really tripping. I have a 510 wagon now that uh, Sung Kang Han from Fast and Furious helped me out with. That I'll definitely bring out. And um, it's here now, finally. Thank God. It's going to need more work than I thought it needed. And um, yeah, R34 situation is just not really, it, it just didn't make sense. And you know what? I, I really do think, because there's just so many other fucking cars I'd want before that. But a 510's always been on my, on my, on my thing. Um, and the Hakusuka now is just, just too out of control as far as the price. But the 510, clean. This one's dope. Definitely bring it out. I went to a car meet yesterday. It was actually pretty dope. Mario writes, uh, day one listener, have two simple questions. Flats or drums, what's your go-to wing sauce? Everyone loves flats. I've never been a flat dude. I mean, I eat it because I don't give a fuck. I like drumsticks. Go-to wing sauce. Like hot sauce? I mean, I like crystals. I like I like reds. Or are you talking about once the wings are already seasoned, do I do blue cheese or ranch? I do ranch, dog. Period. Ramon writes, my question is, through all the business ventures you've been, which one created the most adversities and what did you do to overcome them? Damn, man. I mean, shit. DJing was pretty big. Sneaker fucking selling was big. Jewelry. I mean, there's always, look, it's almost the same any which way. You're going to have a hater. You're going to have new guys that are coming in. I think with the sneaker game, things were different. Back in the day, if you had a thousand bucks on the side, you could figure out and boom. It's like you got guys now who are trying to catch a, a W on the app, on a sneakers app or something. And it's like, bro, y'all are so far behind. You don't even realize it. In your mind, if they, you know, if dude, let's say a dude catches four W's and ends up making 300, 500 bucks, whatever, in the grand scheme of things, there's dudes out there literally making fifty to $100,000 a week at least fifty to $100,000 a month flipping kicks. So, you know, there's just different, again, different levels to this shit. When it comes to the jewelry game, you got a dude who is selling diamonds and been selling diamonds. Let's say he sold a billion dollars of diamonds in his career and he looks at you a certain way because you don't look like the people he came up with. And I pushed that envelope. I've told my story about, you know, winning Jewelry of the Year and coming out downstairs and going to the event and wearing my fucking Dior suit. And the lady's like, no, no, put back your Supreme shit on, put your street clothes back on. And it was because I had changed the look of what a jeweler's supposed to look like. You think any of these motherfuckers on 47th Street, any of these Russian Jewish dudes, any of these motherfucking uh, Armenian guys, any of these regular dudes, period. You think these dudes had tattoos 20 years ago? Fuck No. You think these motherfuckers was wearing J's 20 years ago? No. These motherfuckers is barely wearing them. You see these dudes wearing fucking Amiri and off-white shit like in the last 10 years? Like, come on, dog. But it, it, it's what it is. Like, you know, motherfuckers want to lurk a certain way. Overcoming any adversity takes strong, you know, I'm sorry, I was going to say strong emotions, but it takes a strong back, man. It takes a, a strong gut. I don't have a strong gut. So basically, I'm bleeding while I'm taking these motherfucking shots. And I'm like, yo, dog, that ain't shit. Because I'm going to come out victorious, period, regardless of what you do. Oh, you want to hate on this? Oh, you want to take down the Instagram page? Oh, you want to do this? You want to do this? Dog, it don't matter. I went against the biggest. I went against fucking Nike. How much bigger does it get? During a time where they were literally a monopoly. And like, even Nike now is big, but at least New Balance is getting run. Yeezy is getting run. Other companies are getting run. You could get... Away today with flipping fucking Yeezys and Vans and fucking New Balance and shit like that. And they would just wear designer kicks or whatever. Actually, that's not really an option. But back in 2004, when I went to bat with Nike, shit. Gotta be smart, man. 
you know, got to really lay in the cut. You really got to look at this shit 10, 15 steps ahead. Thank God some of these companies don't and they're too big. And that's how you can defeat them on some David and Goliath shit. But you just really got to be, man, you got to be smart. If you ain't thinking 10 steps ahead, man, go ahead and fucking, you know, throw the towel in, man. Nine Spark writes, he got a bunch of questions real quick. You know what? They're like 10 questions real quick. Boom. Twitter, Instagram, Twitter. Favorite topping on a pizza? Cheese. Favorite pizza place? Don't got one off the top of my head. Favorite current song? Don't got one off the top of my head. Favorite Beyonce song? Don't have one. Your favorite handbag your wife has? Um, Hermes Kelly. Favorite Disney movie? Fuck. Don't even know. Your favorite birthday? Oh, you mean like a birthday party? Shit, man. I think it might be probably my 37th, I think. Was that what it was? It was 30, 36th. My 36th birthday with Jonas, man. It was crazy. Shoe size 11. Go to order at Starbucks. Uh, salted caramel with vanilla sweet cream. Uh, extra sweet cream. In and out of McDonald's. McDonald's. Favorite type of cookie. You know what, man? It just really varies, man. I, I like, um, yeah, man, it really varies, man. Some places don't have like certain care, you know, things. Weed or wax. I'm never going to be a wax dude, man. Weed. Favorite dessert. Mastro's butter cake. Coke or Sprite. It's almost time, man. I'd say Coke. Favorite food your wife can make. Breakfast. Mark Wahlberg or Will Ferrell. Psh, man, it's a toss up, man. Favorite luxury brand. Oh, because that's difficult, right? You know, because there, there could be like Cartier that doesn't make anything. I don't know. That's tough, man. Favorite breakfast food? Spam and motherfucking garlic rice and eggs. All right, man. That was that was pretty good right there. Alan Mack writes, your big fan, been a part of the pod since the beginning. Now that the tops cards are done, what's going to be done about the gold card that was supposed to come when you finished the set? Huh? Bro, I have no idea what you're talking about. But there's a gold card regardless. So my last card was my Mike Trout. So whoever gets that one-on-one gold card, it's fucking money. Shit, what are you talking about? Like, that's that's game. The tops projects are done with the artist. I'm the only person who has his own Chrome set. So I'm still in the game, dog. Still in the game. Uh, Andrew A. writes, Hey, Ben, big basketball fan here, but even f- bigger fan of business. One NBA player who I know dabbles heavily in the venture capital space is KD with his partner, Rich Kleiman. Do you have any stories with either of those two guys? I know Kleiman was initially in the music industry, so you may have ties to that. Also, if you have any of the cool stories to NBA players, I'd love to hear them. Send in love from UConn. Hey, bro, how long have you been listening to this show? I'm just curious, man. You know, Rich Kleiman and me are real good friends. You know, he's been on the podcast, right? So you should listen to the episode with him. I've had tons of stories with KD um and KD was doing the pod we ended up fucking recording and boom but like and just he had to go in the middle of a fucking thing and it was a weird thing whatever I don't trip KD's a, a unique dude um but we're still boys we talk all the time one of my favorite stories with KD is probably back way back I want to say like 2013 I'm at a fucking Lakers Oklahoma City game Thunder game. And KD is talking to Q, world star, rest in peace. And I'm sitting around the floor. I get into a big ass fight with Kendrick Perkins and I'm talking shit to everyone on the Oklahoma team. Remember, Kobe's still playing now. And KD's like, hey man, Q, why don't you, why don't you shut your boy up? And I was like, why don't you shut up, dog? Fix that hair, motherfucker. And he's like, fix my hair. What? So we started jaw jacking all game, man. And he hit the game winning shot, fucking killed us. He was crushed every time this motherfucker hit a three. He's looking dead at me. And people are like, yo, man, shut up. I mean, shut the fuck up, bro. Fuck out of here. You should want to get a motherfucker mad. Like they got Steph mad at the fucking All-Star game. If they can't rise to the occasion, that motherfucker wasn't supposed to win. Give a reason for your opponent to get up. I ain't trying to fight nobody that ain't fucking ready to fight. That shit's so weird, man. Motherfuckers want to fight enemies that are like weak. Like who the fuck wants to do? Why fight then? You know? Anyways, yeah, so there's there's tons. I've known Rich since before fucking, you know, Rock Nation days and when he was, you know, repping Wale and everything. I've known Rich for a long fucking time. You listen to the podcast, pretty good one. 
David Nguyen writes, Dave from the town. What's up, big bro? Love the pod. I grew up in Oakland and now reside in SD. Thank you for all the entertainment free game. Feeling nostalgic. Hope you like these questions. Fat Slice or Blondies? Man, I was going to Berkeley since Fat Slice didn't exist. And the crazy part is now Blondies doesn't exist. And the crazier part is Fat Slice is mid. That shit is terrible. Their fucking slices are doo-doo. Used to walk over there and a, a Fat Slice or a Blondie, no cap, was the size of an iPad 12.9. It was a 13. It was huge. Right? Fucking crazy. Fat Slice, though, overall during my time in the Bay was the top dog. And that's pun intended because Top Dog's still one of my favorite fucking hot dog spots. While I Cal, did you ever get to go to Rasputin and the music stores and five vinyl and the U section for dirt cheap? Yes, I did. Uh, I used to cut school as a kid, just go record hunting. Sometimes I get lucky at those promotional stores for less than 50 cents. Um, Rasputin's, Leopold's, all that shit I used to go through all through. But I used to go to like real shit. I mean, there'd be some shit there, but you weren't going to find some real gangster shit in there. You'd have to go to the city. Uh, final question, there's a bluebird on my shoulder. Can I kill it? <laughs> that's a bluebird. I actually didn't even know he suck and said as a bluebird. Can I, that's fucking hilarious, man. Um, yeah, that, that brought back some shit. That's dope, man. You know what, man? That just reminds me. I got to get fucking Q-Bird on the show, man. We got to talk about some... Q-Bird's brain is too fucking complex for anybody to understand. Faisal or Vizel writes, What's up, man? I love the podcast. Listen to every episode so far. I'm a big supporter. Since you've been in the music industry, you've been around hip-hop all your whole life. Who are your personal five, top five hip-hop albums of all time? Now, because I'm writing this just off the dome piece, very difficult to give you that. But I will think of five hip-hop albums that were monumental to me, right? One, Nas, Illmatic. Two, Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders. That was definitely either that or low end theory. I know one of those motherfuckers changed my life. NWA, straight out of Compton, hands down. Far side, bizarre ride to the far side. Eric B's first album brings back crazy shit. EPMD's first album. But to make that five list, uh, who else was on there? I just said I say oh, Ice Cube, America's most wanted. Period. Good question, dog. Cody Vincent writes, what's your thoughts on Boxable? Thought it's a good topic as it has ties to Elon, supposedly. Understand this. I don't give a fuck about Elon like that. It ain't deep. I just I think people got me fucked up with whatever. Like, cool. And, you know, I'm glad I'm on a good terms with dude. But uh, Boxable, I know there's a few companies that are simple like that. They basically hit, they make those 200 square foot houses that you could put in the backyard. You could put in a lot somewhere. I don't know. I don't know the situation with rent, whatever. But I think it's cool for fun. Like, I'd put a Boxable... You know, a little like one bedroom house that would be like, if we had more land, I'd put it somewhere and have my kids go in there and have a little area to fucking play and fucking do a little secretive shit or anything. As far as for me, like, nah, man, I got an RV. I'd rather be, you know, pushing around the city. So there's that. <laughs> Nolan Souza writes, hey, Ben, what kind of advice would you give to a 23-year-old making 70K a year about to move back home and save even more money? Also, thank you for taking a moment to snap a pic a few years ago at the Hawks game. Um, 23 year old making 70 K a year and living at home. Look, bro, I would advise having some stable money somewhere, whether that be in a Bitcoin situation, because I think real estate might be a little difficult. And, um, I would even fucking fuck around and try to invest in some basketball cards that, you know, I know it's hard to say, oh, you never know, think's ever a sure, sure thing. Russell Wilson could be fucked up here and there. Like, there's some people I feel like they're starting to rise up. Like, Mookie Betts could have a monster next few years. So a rookie card of his is not that much. It's like 1300 1500 bucks for like a PSA 10, you know? There's just certain things you could put your money into. You know, Gary Vee invested, you know, a G into LeBron James rookies. And I know the things exploded. And, you know, of course, he was in it before that. But you really should think about, you know, if you do have a little bit of a savings, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Some people, look, they save... And in a year, if they can save 25 grand, cool. You can make three times that just using Ethereum, you know, and, and Bitcoin. You ain't got to buy an NFT, you know, just having money in, in some of these things, you know, just, just sitting there chilling. Don't sit there and look at it right now because Bitcoin is down right now and Ethereum is down. That's the game. Um, as far as you make a 70K a year, 
you know, you should make that money work for you. So eventually, depending on, you know, what you do later, by the time you're 30, let's see, 70K, let me do the math here real quick. By the time you're 30, realistically, you should have a half million dollars saved. Now, that's just saved from, you know, living whatever. If you could have a half million dollars saved, that half million dollars should be $3 million if you, if you invested it correctly. Whether you play certain stocks, whether you play in the crypto game, you know, and then I suggest you jump into real estate. I don't think you should jump into real estate right now at 23. I, it, it'd be too much to explain right now. My boy Thatch should probably explain it to you a little better because he would tell you, fuck it, 23 is good enough. But it seems like, you know, well, actually, no, because you have a, a college um, email address. Actually, you probably out of college by now. I mean, real estate is viable. I don't know, you know, depending on what state you're in. Just think that certain crypto is easier. And if I die on that hill, then it is what it is, man. But appreciate you, Nolan. Voltaire. That's a that's a name right there, dog. Kuya Ben. Huge fan of the show. I listened to your show religiously since Jump, and I've been a fan since the beginning of the LRG Jonas syrup drinking days. Thanks for giving me some something valuable to listen to for all the days I have long drives and works too. And I'm on the when I'm on the treadmill. Truly love listening to your life advice and hearing well our stories. My question is: I know you had a falling out with Regi, and you did that episode about as the reasoning. From listening to your shows, it seems like you once cut a person off. It's a wrap. But I also like, like I said, I listen religiously. And with the recent passing of Virgil, I know you wish you had dropped off a petty feud with him and not waste all those years. You think you could drop this with Luigi and have him come on the show and talk about what happened? <laughs> Salamat. Wash Lord. Um, it's funny you said that, man. So, Luigi got robbed. I mean, it's a podcast. I know people know here and there, whatever. And if people talk, it is what it is. I don't really go on the internet like that. But I reached out to him after that. I said, you know, I don't like that shit. That ain't cool. And I talked to him. He's like, yo, man, hope all is well, Pada. You're making me sad. You know, I wish uh, everything was cool. We could do boom. Different thing with Virgil. Virgil, I was... A little, you know, I felt a little entitled, right? I felt like, you know, I was, and in a certain way, I never invested into the relationship. So that's different. The way Virgil is, boom, it was how it ended and that's where it is. I invested a lot of time, effort, energy, pushing the fucking, you know, the Asian, especially on the Filipino vibe thing with uh, Ruigi. I highly doubt I have him on the show, but I don't hate dude. I don't want any, you know, anything to happen to dude, whatever. I just think it's a waste of my time to even talk about it anymore. And it was, a, it was a different level of respect and certain shit. So it is what it is. It's not that you cut somebody off, man. You just kind of move on, you know? So yeah, that I hope that answers your question, bro. Mr. Clap writes, hey, Ben, big ups. I've been a day one podcast fan. It's become my ritual to listen every Monday and Thursday ever since the very first episode. I'm a 46-year-old dad from the Boston area. I have an eight-year-old son, so I relate a lot of the talk you share with your kids in Roblox. Uh... Also, a vinyl era retired DJ. When I first started listening to you, you were supposed to do a DJ AM episode with Homicide that never happened. Would be dope to hear some stories. I know y'all ran in the same crew for a while. Anyways, quick story. I was recently going through my record collection, which runs very deep, and I came across a hip-hop compilation album that you put out with you on the cover. Man, that double record was hitting. You had some certified classic party rocking bangers on there. What was the thought process like when you put that out? Any gems for us, man? Any story behind it was like, wow, when I realized that, you, that it was you that put that out. It's been in my collection for 20 plus years. I actually have two plus copies of it. Keep putting out consistent gems for us from all angles. Even just advice hits out. Peace to you and the Dust Brothers, Bill Blast. Shit. That was, uh, I can't remember if it was Hip Hop Classics 1, Hip Hop Classics 2, if it was Straight Butter or Straight Jams. I had like four or five compilations that I put out um, priority records. A lot of people don't know this because I don't really talk about it. Um, if it's the one that I was on the cover on, I don't remember which one, if it was one or two, but it was just a side hustle thing. And my inspiration behind that was I was working with Brian Turner, you know, CEO of Priority Records, who, you know, birthed the career of, you know, Dr. Dre, Easy, and all those guys, uh, NWA, Ice Cube, and all them. And uh, well, their album careers, Ice Cube solo career. Master P, you name it, all this shit. He's CEO of Priority Records. I told him, I said, look, man, let's get this vinyl game going. Vinyl's a big part of this. Let me make some compilations for DJs to have, you know, classic records. And we can, you know, 
let's you know pay the royalties and make some bread on this. We ended up actually selling a hundred something, like 175,000 records. It's a lot of fucking records. If you guys know, especially then when money was, you know, when, when you're making money on records, it was crazy. It started getting so big that my friend Spring Aspers, you could Google that name, Spring Aspers. She's been a music supervisor for fucking so many movies. I sparked her journey to start doing compilations, start doing things like that and start doing soundtracks and shit. And it, it was dope. You know, I put out like four or five records. One of them went fucking gold, which is crazy. But yeah, oh, back to the DJ AM episode. You know, man, it's on homicide, man. Homicide's health right now is just kind of, um, he's just getting back in the swing of things. I know it's been a while, but he actually has been, you know, down for a little bit, like probably right after we did that show with me and homicide. So I don't know. It's also tough, man. I feel like I, I thought we did an AM episode, but yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get to that because AM is my dog and definitely for sure, man. Uncle Ben, I have made a promise to myself that this year I will propose to my girlfriend of 12 years. When you proposed to Nick, what kind of emotions were you having prior to popping the question and how did you deal with them? You know what, man? When I was thinking about popping the question, Nicolette, she's always mad. Like, you should have had somebody film it. Just, man, fuck all that bullshit. I, I prepared the most important part, but like, I just didn't want to like, I don't know, like somebody videotaping it was just like, I don't know, man. That's the only thing she ever gives me shit. I wish you had somebody to videotape this. So one, if you can videotape it, have somebody videotape it. I just, you know, I was like, you know, it was a different time then, right? It was obviously, you know, there's iPhones and shit, but it was just a different fucking time. Um, as far as like emotions that were going through, I was like, yo, this is it. This is really it. Let me get, the only thing I was gambling on, I knew she'd say yes, but the only thing I was gambling on was, am I ready to, you know, really commit and make sure that um, that this is going to be the one and we don't know what, you know, because we barely knew each other. A year and a half in is pretty fast. I think it was like maybe a year even. And it was just, but you, know, you get older, you go through certain things, you know where people are in life, you know where timing is. All the green lights were coming in. There were no red lights that were coming in. Red flags, literally none. There might have been a yellow flag with like, cautionary stuff that she didn't like, but I wasn't even tripping on that. As far as the thought of having to settle down to one woman, I mean, bro, if you can't grow up and figure that out, that's why I feel like, look, man, motherfuckers getting married in their 20s, like, go out and do some fucking, go out and get that shit out of your system, you know? But that's the best advice I can give you as far as proposing, and um, I did it at a fucking restaurant. I got, I got, <laughs> I proposed to her at La Scala, one of, just one of my favorite restaurants, Italian restaurants in Beverly Hills, but, there that is. Um, real business fan question. Hey, Ben, uh, I'm 28. I made $200,000 in Bitcoin this past bull run. I'm renting an apartment right now and was wondering if I should move that money and buy a single family home in Los Angeles or continue to letting that money to sit in crypto and stocks with real estate at all-time highs. I'm starting to think I could get better return on investment elsewhere, but I don't like the idea of renting also. I'm single and I'm also looking to maximize my 200K investment for long term. If you're looking at shit for long term, I would say think about giving one hundred thousand dollars away. When I say giving away, putting it in something where you'd be like, "Yo, look, this is I don't give a fuck. You know, I'm not thinking about this anymore. Think about that. You're 28. Think about that 100k when you're 35. If it hits a million, that's your hundred thousand dollars to get you to a million. As far as the other money, that's where you let sit in that. You know, what I mean, that bull run was good. Obviously, our shit's terrible right now. Um, and this was you sent me this three days ago, so. Fuck, I hope that you didn't really, you know, take too bad of a beating. Um, I'll wait till obviously things get up. But as far as renting, renting sucks. I did it here and there at, you know, at 28. I was, was I, renting? yeah, I was still renting at 28. Buying a home in Los Angeles is not an option. That is nothing I would fucking do unless maybe you're like in, in the outskirts somewhere, like in fucking Downey or in Monterey Park or somewhere that's solid that has a very, very super high occupancy rate, you know, even though people complain about San Francisco, oh, the rent's too high, the real estate's too high, whatever, boom, they still got a very high occupancy rate, right? Because the schools are good. So if you could, I mean, if LA is where you're at, then boom, yeah, find a place that you could live at, boom. But if not, I'd get the fuck out. If you're single, you know, like, fuck it. Move to fucking Vegas, bro. You know, save on taxes and everything else. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be my advice. So you could definitely, you know, make your bread, but that 200K you just made on the last bull run, imagine what you could do. Now flip that 100K, keep 100K in, in Bitcoin and do the 100K and get aggressive with it. 
Doc, if you don't make some real bread on this and come back on the show, man, I'll kill you. Yo, Ben Baller, I'm at a warehouse job, eight to five. I feel stuck. What should I do or do you recommend I do to leave or do something else? I have four kids and I feel like if I leave my job, I'm not guaranteed another one. Dog, this is maybe the toughest fucking question and I don't know how to even fucking answer this, you know, because I have kids. I couldn't imagine if I had four kids and I made the money I make right now. So people say, oh, so much easier. Just there's so many other things you got to do as far as like the cost of living. I honestly don't know how the hell. Now, I'm assuming you have four kids with the same woman. So hopefully that makes it a little better. But you still got four miles to feed. And I don't know if they're young kids or older kids. But that's a lot of stress. If I were you... Eight to five, you know, you're punching in a clock and it's at a warehouse job. So there's really not too much thought process outside of there. You know, you could even think about for a max of an hour when you're driving home or whatever about what you might need to do the next day. Other than that, bro, if you have insurance that covers all four kids, man, bro, that's a tough one. I don't think I'd leave, you know, because if you leave... Think about what you're risking and think about what you're putting your kids through. That's why it fucking, it, it just, man, I hate to say this shit. I just didn't want to have kids until I was able to take care of them the way I wanted to, you know? I know that's not your situation now, but if you're not in a situation, if you're in a situation where you're not getting insurance, getting benefits, whew, man, bro, that's a lot easier to leave, you know, just because, but benefits these days are fucked up anyway. I mean, I need a little bit more context, you know, with, with, with what's going on with you. But if you had any type of money, I would try to fucking, you know, put that shit somewhere where it's growing. It's a tough question to ask, you know, as far as recommending, you know, investing is going to be the safest because you're not really probably saving too much as it is right now. I don't know what you, I don't know if you're saving 200 bucks a week, if you're saving 200 bucks a month, I don't know what your situation is. But anything's better than what you're doing right now, obviously, if it's enough to, to pay the bills and stuff. But, man, that's a tough one. This one hurts my heart, man. I, I just really think, you know, it really depends on what, you know, what your health insurance situation is like. What's that like? If there is there any growth there? If you feel like you really are stuck and there really is no growth at the same time, too, I don't know how old you are, so it's really difficult. You know, if you're over 30 years old, I'm saying if you're under 35... You know, and some people are like, well, shit, 35 is old. I don't know, dog. You know, 35 is when my, you know, I had another glow up at 37. I had another glow up at 42. But I'm also an entrepreneur and I'm, you know, I'm self-made. I don't have a boss. So it's tough, man. You said four kids, bro. You know, I'm sorry, man. I know it sounds like a bitch thing to say. And some people may not like this. But if you do have benefits, I would just stay because, man, you know, why put your kids through hell and hell? I just couldn't. I, I, even though my dad kind of, you know, put some things through me. I couldn't, man, I, I hate how I grew up. I don't give a fuck what the success story was. I just don't want that for my kids, bro. I'd rather have them have a chill life and just be, you know, happy. Happy to me is, is just much more important than anything else, man. That was a tough one, man. That probably fucked me up. This is a fucking funny-ass question, Miles. Sorry, man, I'm just reading this shit. Question, how do I get in with the Asian community as a black guy? I've been traveling to PNW, Seattle and SF, Recently, and I have respectfully noticed the large Asian population. I'd love to make friends with them, but I'm afraid of the stereotypes they may have against me as a black guy. You've even said that older Asian folk tend to pass down these negative stereotypes. Do you have any advice for me for networking, making friends without them, spite of my blackness? Imagine being a black dude walking in Pacifica. Jesus, Pacifica, obviously California. Um, <laughs> shout out to my pate. Uh, from Van Culture, my boy Paul is Filipino dude. It's like super fucking Filipino town. You know what, dog? I feel like, it, it, I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of the Asians in Seattle and SF are much more progressive than anywhere else. You know, if you were in Westminster, I think it'd be a little more difficult to break in. I just feel like, you know, the Bay has a little bit more love. As Seattle's, depending on where you are, I know there's a Vietnamese community. There's a lot of Koreans, a ton of Koreans in, in Seattle. But the Filipino community in Seattle, they're not like that. In general, I'm going to be honest with you. And you have to understand, 
please understand, at least with the major four, some people sit there and be like, hey man, what about us? What about the Hmongs? What about the, you know, the Malaysians? Dog, we can get in that another time. <laughs> I'm just talking about the majority shit right now. Definitely know the difference between someone from China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, fucking, you know, and then you can get down to fucking, obviously, for uh, Laos and all these other places, Thailand, things like that. Know that, obviously, understand what the difference between all those are, first of all. You know, study the culture a little bit. You know, eat the foods that you like and certain things and understand so you don't sound like you're a fucking just some some real super outsider that has no idea what's going on. But in benefit for you, who doesn't want to have a black guy hanging around, man? You guys are the shit, right? You know, you guys are funny in general. You know, you guys have a lot of, you know, just there's just a lot of positive things that you also bring to a group of Asian people. Now, as far as the negative stereotypes, I think they're going to be there, man. You know, and um, if your feelings are soft, you know, I feel like Asian people aren't going to be as harsh. It just depends. You're talking about, I don't know how old you are, but the younger ones, there might be some who are, you know, has some generalizations and stuff and everything. And again, I don't know what you look like. I don't know people like, oh, it's fucked up. That's so fucking, you know, um, what the fuck is the word I'm looking for? So fake or so, so, so not stereotypical. What the fuck is the word? Jesus Christ. But the, the world is that way. You know, they look at looks, they look at, at, you know, what you make and certain things. I just feel like in general, if we're talking amongst all the Asian races, Filipinos have always been the most welcoming. And um, they've always been just the coolest. Learn the food. That's a big deal. Um, adobo's chicken is, is uh, you know, chicken adobo is, is obviously Filipino food. You know, kalbi is Korean food. Sushi is Japanese food. All right. Chow mein is Chinese food. I'm just saying, you know, like pad thai is Thai food. So just know that. Obviously, pho is Vietnamese food. So just know the basic shit, but no more than that. I think you're going to be all right. Yo, what's good, bed? Uh, Chris Cheek writes, I know you, you're well-traveled and well-connected. So I was wondering if you ever had any stories with Big Meech or his brother T. Also, you ever run into any Italian mobsters during your time in NYC back in the 90s? It's funny you said that, man. Some crazy shit. Very, very minor shit. Um, never had ever met Big Meech in person. I've met T before. Never spoke about this ever. Shit, it's crazy. In the K-Town Hustler Part 2, I should have mentioned that um, because it was before my time as a jeweler, it was right there at that border. It was right at the cusp where it'd be at the end of K-Town Hustler 2 going to hit K-Town Hustler 3. T owned a car dealership right on Ventura Boulevard and Colfax. It is now um, Platinum fucking chauffeur service, I think. I don't know what it is, what it is. even though Platinum Motorsport is my family and those are my people's. There's like this little electric car company. I forgot what the fuck they're called. It's like a one single car. It's like a weird like triangular shaped car. But that place has been several dealerships. It used to be, Ray J used to have a dealership there. And I think Kim K used to get her cars there. And there's a bunch of things. But at one point around 2004 or so, my boy Cecil, who used to work at the OG Daz and then ran Spreewell Motorsports and had his own little spot, he ran this spot for T. And I had no idea what the fuck was going on. And I thought it was real weird. And I remember he was kind of getting punked by these dudes. Cecil had been around some real gangsters, some real killers and shit, but he wasn't really like a gangster himself. And um, Cecil was really close with Chris Mills, who was a legendary dude in the car game, 310 motoring. He was obviously in McDonald's All-American, was the number one basketball player to probably ever come out of Fairfax High School, played in the pros and all that, was involved in all kinds of crazy shit, real gangster. My boy Tracy Mills is his brother, blood brother. But yeah, so T owned this dealership, and I was like, who the fuck are you let, Who are these dudes that you let just beat your ass? And there was all kinds of crazy shit going on until I watched the BMF documentary I didn't know that was T and I met the, it was crazy. So um, during the 310 era, they I knew about it. And I was talking to Mark Laidler, who's the, the founder of 310 Motoring. I was talking to some, a few other people like, yo, these, these dudes are from Detroit. And I thought that was crazy. When I got in the jewelry business, right at the tail end of their crazy run, I made this dude a uh, bull from BMF. I made him and another dude, I won't say his name because he's, he's still dealing with some shit right now. I had made him a BMF for life grill. So if you were following me since the MySpace days, you remember I was making some BMF jewelry. And uh, my boy Blue Da Vinci is my dog. You know, he's part of BMF as well. I don't know where Blue is today, but that's my boy. 
Uh, ever run into any Italian mobsters during your time back in the NYC? Uh, I ran into the Gambino family's sons. So I forgot the dude's name. I don't know. I mean, I just want, it's obviously like his name was maybe Johnny Gambino or something, but I ran into the Gambino's son and then um, meeting a lot of dudes that were in all the Italian movies, Bronx Tale, Goodfellas, all that stuff. I remember there was some dudes that looked real. I mean, they really looked the part. And uh, they were whooping people's asses back in the day. It was, it was a trip. Uh, what the fuck is his fucking name? God damn it, man. He beat up Jean-Claude Van Damme. He was a fucking security at fucking Scores, a strip club in New York. And he's on the show Oz. Uh, I can't think of his fucking name. God damn it. T- super fucking Italian Goomba dude. Can't remember his name. But I met that dude. At Creek Alley when I was DJing there. This is a spot where I met Dr. Dre and everybody where I formally got their shit when the spot that Denzel owned. And I met some Italian mobsters there. I wish I had some better answers for you, but that big meat shit with the brother T, that shit fucked me up when I found that out. So, anyways, guys, that's all the questions I got for right now, man. There's a lot more actually, but we'll do this another time because fuck, this is taking too much of the show up. But I appreciate the questions. I really love all the questions you guys have asked. There's some really good ones too, and I'll probably Carry him over to next month's episode. Yo, Miles, hit us off with a little Lakey Lake. God damn, that was a lot of questions. I feel like I was talking for fucking ever and ever. I don't know why. What's up? But man, I appreciate you guys again. Um, anyone feel like their fucking subscription services are adding up? And I say that because I know Amazon Prime just raised the price, but I just thought about it. I was like, fuck, you know what? There's $15 here, 13 14 14 here, nine 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 here, this, boom. Because I have a bunch of channels that are on Amazon too. And I was like, God damn, how the fuck do I got like $800 in subscriptions, right? It's a car note. That's a Tesla note. So it's just weird. I remember just talking to myself. I don't know. Um, Martin, the show did a 30 year anniversary and, uh, I didn't watch it. I know Tommy wasn't on it, but got me thinking anybody who grew up in the early nineties and was watching TV shows like Martin and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, if you chose Fresh Prince of Bel-Air over Martin, then I just knew immediately, like I knew what type of person you were. It was, you was on some goofy shit, right? Um, and I know it's two different topics, right? One was like a younger show, one was more of a, of a grown show, but I've just always been more of a Martin dude. But with that said, I have not downloaded the Peacock app on any of my TVs, but Bel Air is the talk of fucking social media. Everyone keeps talking about this show, Bel Air, right? And I just seen Jaden Smith the other day, and I didn't bring it up to him. I don't know. I just thought about him for some reason. But Wale had said, I'm going to end up hating Carlton on Bel Air. So do me a favor. On today's episode, when you go to the Instagram page, you go to Ben Baller Pod, go to the IG page, leave a comment and tell me if I should watch Bel Air the show. And I'm going to tally up the votes from there and make a decision. You guys are handling that right there. Okay? All right, man. All-star game. Three-point contest. Yo, shout out to my boy Carl Towns. Cat, you know, he won. And you know what? He's really showing himself like people said, don't fuck with him. He flies low on the radar even though he's tall as shit. Dude is actually cool as fuck in person. I don't appreciate how MJ did him when he was, uh, uh, you know, showing, when MJ was showing love to Doncic. But um, the three-point contest was, was, it was cool, whatever. Dunk contest was definitely the worst dunk contest in the history of dunk contests. It was so fucking bad. They may need to fucking remove the dunk contest unless they get some real fucking people involved in the dunk contest. Now, all-Star game, I thought was going to be mid as fuck. Ended up being a great game. Shout out to Steph Curry. Won the first Kobe Bryant award. Um, broke the NBA uh, All-Star game three record. And everything was lit. The only part that was fucked up was they should have just did the NBA 75 before the fucking game. That was the longest fucking halftime break I've ever seen or whatever the fuck it was. That new format that they're using is cool too. It's been, what, five years now? But it was just weird. The thing that fucked me up was Michael Jordan wasn't going to show up, I thought, because he was a NASCAR event. 
which was, uh, I think actually the NASCAR event was in the same state. So it wasn't really that far. Dude owns a fucking sick ass private jet, but he did pull up. So it was fucking dope to see him there. I know there's controversy with NBA 75 with, you know, who made the list, who didn't, should Dwight Howard got snubbed and some other people, but it is what it is. To see Dame, Dame, look, I'm a huge Dame Lillard fan. I am a big fan of his. I think it's too soon to put him on a 75 right now. I think he's going to end up in a Hall of Fame, whatever, but I just think it was too soon to put him on that list. There's some older cats on there that I'm not familiar with, and I've watched a lot of basketball, even seen footage of Jerry West and all that shit and fucking Koozie and fucking Pistol Pete and all that, but there's some dudes definitely. I'm like, what the fuck? But when I saw Kobe's image, it definitely fucked me up and put me in a weird spot. You know, just hearing his name kind of makes me just, damn, just still bug out that he's gone. When they showed MJ, there's a clip of MJ pulling up and it's like the goat rooms, like everyone's in there, fucking Jason Kidd, uh, Gary Payton's in there, Dwayne Wade. And he calls Magic an old man. And then Magic's laughing, you know, just being a nice guy. Remember, Magic has HIV and this motherfucker is stronger and bigger than ever. Still one of the craziest businessmen in the world, richest shit. And of course, MJ's fucking super rich. But it's like, I feel like Magic is more in tune with the game. Whereas I feel like Jordan is is doing other stuff in sports and other things. Not saying that Jordan don't know who the fuck is. Well, obviously he he knows he owns his basketball team, but I feel like Magic is definitely much more in tune with the youth and younger dudes and stuff. And just you know, Michael's you know side of golf. He's got a NASCAR team. He's got other things going on. Bottom line is, in that clip where he says, "Where your shoes at? You got your shoes on. You put your shoes on. Let's play one on one." He was fucking serious as fuck. And if you haven't watched The Last Dance, then go watch that shit to understand the backstory and everything. But anyways, Team LeBron won, and good for them. Fuck, I don't give a shit. Listen, fuck all that shit, LeBron. Great. You won back in Cleveland. Fucking excited for you and fucking Rich Paul and Clutch Sports and all that other bullshit. No one gives a fuck, okay? I know you're talking about you'll do whatever. You will guarantee you're going to whatever if they draft Bronny or doing all the, the bullshit, whatever, all that punk-ass shit. And I know it's it's 2024, so it's like, what, two and a half more seasons until you get to, you know, make that decision, whatever. You'll be, you know, Tom Brady of, of basketball. Great. Doc, all I give a fuck about is you going back to L.A. tomorrow and getting back to business because we need to make the fucking playoffs. Fuck a playing game. At the very least, at the very least, we need to guarantee a playing game. Just like you're bugging, okay? Anyway, speaking of Cleveland, uh, Cuddy pulled out. Not going to tell you why, but he pulled out and um, I was supposed to link up with him yesterday. I feel bad. I couldn't. I had some other shit. I pulled up to a car meet because I, my boy, I told him, you know, you make promises to people and shit. I was talking to my little homie Keys, Keys to the Jungle on Instagram. Good kid. You know, he's going to try to go to 365 car meets this year. I think he's achieved quite a bit. It goes to like two or three a day, whatever. And... um I told them on Saturday night that I was going to go to Malibu. I was like, hey, is it going to be cool? Whatever, boom. I wasn't even thinking. I was just like, oh, fuck it. I wanted to bring the Tesla out, kind of show people the slam plaid. He gets there, text messages me, and I'm at Starbucks getting coffee. And he's like, yo, bro, it's pretty lit. You know, there's like, you know, 100 cars here, whatever. I was like, what the fuck? You went? Dude drove all the way from Irvine. So if you know, that's well over an hour drive. And I was like, yo, you know what? At that point, I'm wearing fucking... Uh, crazy looking socks, like safari socks. I'm wearing these red wing slippers that a fan gave me. And I have shorts on and I just look crazy. I was like, fuck this. Got in the car, was literally about to order my drink. I was first in line now. And I was like, left, got in the car, boom, smashed over there. Got to Malibu in fucking like 23 minutes. I was going fast as a motherfucker in the, in the plaid. And so whatever, um, and then I had to go get my kids to get a haircut and all the other stuff. And they had a play date. So I feel bad I didn't catch up with Cud. But anyways, that was my weekend pretty much besides the Six Flags and all this stuff. But it's not over. Because today we're going to, uh, you know, the kids don't have school. So we're going to have a little fun today and all that stuff. Um, Power Book 4. AK, or is it Power Book 3? I forgot. Is it 3 or 4? I forgot. Anyways, Force with Tommy. It was mid. It was all right, though. It was It was watchable. But it was definitely a filler episode, you know. 50 gave us two fire-ass episodes, and I feel like the next couple would be like, eh, it is what it is. Euphoria 
was mid as fuck. The last three or four Euphoria has been mid as fuck. Stop being a fucking Zendaya dick writer. These motherfucking episodes are not the shit at all whatsoever. Okay? And it got me thinking about this saying that I was thinking about while I was taking a shit at the Chateau Marmont. Sometimes things that are free are still too expensive. Okay? I'm not going to break that down. You figure that out. Sometimes some things that are free are still too expensive. All right? All right, you figure that out. I love you guys. My BAPE collaboration is definitely still coming out next month. We got this shit in the works right now. My gold surfboard is super flex when you put that, yo, buy one of them surfboard holders. This shit is, don't, you can put it against the wall, lean it, but this shit is nice. It's gold, metallic gold. It's beautiful. It's a flex. It's a, this is a living room, TV room, man cave. This is a fucking flex. The entryway, your house, all that shit. Ben Ball did the blockchain. We come in the motherfucking back. We coming back, back, back. Like, <laughs> I don't have the fucking soundbite for that, but yo, we coming back, back. All right, guys, make it a great day. Enjoy the holiday. I know we back to work. Listen, I'm going to drop an episode this Thursday. I do have some interviews that I need to figure out. So there may be an interview on Thursday. I was going to drop the Kendra uh, Lust interview on Thursday, but you know what? Not on my anniversary episode where I'm about to go on vacation with my wife, even though she knows I'm friends with people, but like not that. I'm going to fucking have somebody else on the show. But anyways, guys, all love. I appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to this show. It helps us out a lot more. All right. And I'm going to bring my favorite dude out here. My man, Lakey Lake. Yo, take us out of here, fam. All right. Peace. Peace.